It's going to be a long one, warning you in advance. Okay, so it actually seems like, once again, the most probable modern high-speed rail line in North America is likely to come to Texas. If you followed high-speed rail in the US or Canada, you'll know it's been a rough road, to say the least. Projects proposed, projects delayed, projects cancelled. Of course, the last few presidents of the United States have talked a lot about high-speed rail, and some of them have even made the project in Texas a priority. Though despite being a priority, it hasn't gotten built, and very little has actually been built. Meanwhile, while US presidents have been talking about high-speed rail, countries all over the place, from Spain to Italy, have actually been building it. But ever since it became clear that Amtrak was going to be getting tens of billions of dollars of new funding for high-speed rail, thanks to recent infrastructure bills, and Andy Byford, a man who has run more transit systems than many people have used, was getting on board to Amtrak, the question has sort of been on everyone's mind. What is going to happen? With this much money and a man who was named Train Daddy running the show, clearly something must be in the works. And then the news dropped. Texas Central Partners, who has very slowly been advancing a plan for high-speed rail in Texas over years and years, is actually looking to work with Amtrak to advance high-speed rail in the state. And one of my favorite transit leaders, Andy Byford, was even quoted as saying the Dallas to Houston corridor has great potential. But what is Texas Central? Is this a good use of high-speed rail money? And could this project finally break the seemingly endless deadlock of high-speed rail projects in the US? Let's find out. If you're new here, I'm Reese. I run RM Transit, which is a channel about public transportation from high-speed rail to bus rapid transit around the world and in North America please consider subscribing to help me bring you more videos about public transit. So what is Texas Central? Well, the project would be a new high-speed rail line, roughly 250 miles running from Houston to Dallas by way of a station near College Station, home of the very famous and very large Texas A&M University. The corridor is one of the most populous in North America, with over 12 million residents and tons of travel between the various cities. I've been following this project for a long time with a lot of optimism. It's really doing what I wish California high-speed rail would do, connecting two major cities with a relatively short and simple high-speed rail line to get the high-speed machine going. But I have to be honest, following Texas Central has been a painful experience. It steps forward and then there's a legal challenge. It steps forward and then the CEO steps down. But the project has kept crawling along, securing major legal wins and even signing on Ron Fay, the Spanish rail operator famous for operating high-speed trains all over the place, to sign on to the project. You can learn more about Ron Fay and the Spanish high-speed rail network in my Spanish high-speed rail video. What's really cool about Texas Central is that instead of trying to approach high-speed rail from working up from the draconian North American rail regulations and operating practices, it sort of sidestepped all of that by planning a completely independent high-speed railway that will not be connected to the mainline rail network in North America. That's actually not so different from how, say, a subway line works, or the high-speed rail system in Japan, the Shinkansen. And I actually think this is a really smart approach. In Japan, the high-speed network is entirely independent of the traditional mainline narrow-gauge network. Now, in large part, that's because the narrow-gauge network isn't technically capable of handling true high-speed service. But that's also because the way you want a good, high-capacity high-speed rail network to operate is kind of incompatible with traditional mainline train operations. And in a lot of ways, the problems that face Japan aren't so different from the problems that face North America. The way our mainline trains and infrastructure operate just means that it's quite possible that the most cost-effective way to introduce high-speed rail is to just create an entirely new railway. And that's especially true when you're starting from basically nothing as you would be in Texas. In Europe, or potentially in the Northeast Corridor, there are electrified urban approaches that might be useful for high-speed rail, but that does not exist in Texas. As in Japan, you can always use existing utility, railway, and other transportation corridors to get into and around city centers. With this approach, you're building what you need for high-speed rail and nothing more, so no infrastructure built to be compatible with multi-mile long diesel pulled container trains. To be clear, this is not exactly what the US has tried to do historically. Amtrak's Northeast Corridor is more or less an interoperable North American high-speed rail line, albeit with higher speeds and the bespoke access signaling system that allows for better operations and capacity. 
and then there's the new kid on the block, Brightline, which has been building cool and useful new rail projects that interoperate with North American freight, at least so far, and use existing trains designed for North American operations, meaning they're heavier and probably slower than they could otherwise be. Of course, adopting the Japanese model of high-speed rail network construction isn't an accident, because the line will actually use Japanese Shinkansen rolling stock, an 8-car variant of the N700S Shinkansen model to be specific, and the line would also use standard Japanese overhead line electrification, 25 kV AC, as well as the digital ATC signaling system that's used on the high-speed network in Japan. Adopting these complex technical systems from Japan, and probably a lot of their regulations and standards, seems like a better idea than trying to reinvent the wheel for North America. Again, especially if you can build an entirely new independent system. And to be fair, in a lot of ways, this won't be the first system to adopt the Japanese standard for high-speed rail. China, Taiwan, and India all have, or are going to, essentially do that. Indeed, Japan isn't just exporting its subway building know-how, but also its high-speed rail building know-how. By choosing to use the very high performance but lightweight Shinkansen trains, Texas Central needs less expensive infrastructure, can design a more flexible route, has more capacity, and riders will never have to worry about being shoved into a siding while a freight train drives by. Now, there are three stations along the route, and there are actually some really nice, not final, renders of what the stations could look like. The stations look big, bright, open, and full of spaces to wait for your train. Sort of like the lovely Brightline stations crossed with London Bridge. And the stations are designed to have indoor connections to adjacent development, as well as large pickup drop-off areas and bus loops, which reminds me a lot of Shinkansen stations in Japan. The Dallas station is just south of downtown, connected to the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center, as well as being close to multiple stations on Dallas's fairly extensive DART rail system. It seems like the plan here is to have four platforms elevated above ground, which is fairly typical for a major high-speed rail station in Japan. And four platforms should allow for trains every five minutes or so, which is very high capacity, meaning eight-car trains should probably be fine, and also just really good from a service perspective. I can also already imagine incredibly cool videos of the Dallas skyline with Shinkansen bullet trains traveling in front of it that are currently just a figment of my imagination, but would be really cool in the future. Now roughly two-thirds of the way south to Houston, you have the Brazos Valley Station, which would serve College Station as well as Huntsville, which have universities with a combined student population of over 100,000, which will be a fairly quick bus ride away. And that includes Texas A&M. It's also fairly likely that this station, given its fairly rural location, could have a lot of transit-oriented development built around it, forming a sort of new town. The station's design is nice, like the stations in Dallas and Houston, and it appears like it's going to be an accurate. I'd imagine it will also have passing tracks so that you can have some express services that are a little faster from Dallas to Houston, and then stopping services which stop at this station. Finally, we get to Houston, which has a worse station location than Dallas, being about six miles northwest of central Houston, near a highway interchange, which, depending on how you look at it, could be a good thing or a bad thing. To be fair, this station also does look beautiful, and given the inevitable improvements to transit service and transit-oriented development in the area, it's unlikely to be a wasteland for very long. So with the stations out of the way, what does the actual route look like? Well, it's going to be, as I said, around 250 miles long, and over half of it is elevated above ground on a mixture of viaducts, as you would commonly see in Japan, and embankments. This will allow farmers whose lands the train right-of-way passes through to still access all of their land easily. Service will be fast, as you'd expect, with trains traveling at over 200 miles per hour, and they'll do the end-to-end -end journey in less than 90 minutes. Meanwhile, driving between the locations in Dallas and Houston is at least three and a half hours at the right time of a good day. That means even accounting for the probably inevitable several mile last mile journeys in both Dallas and Houston, the high-speed rail service is going to be way faster than driving. And that's before the inevitable densification around the stations. That means that many people will be traveling to a location that's right at the station anyways. Even if in the first few years before the transit's fully connected up, you have to rent a car or more likely grab an Uber or a taxi, you're still coming out way ahead in terms of travel time. And in a lot of cases, you actually probably won't have to because Texas's big cities have fairly extensive transit systems and they're growing quickly. And it's actually going to be faster than flying too. 
the flight between Houston and Dallas is an hour, and given the sizes and distance of those airports from the city centers, the time it's going to take you to get to the airport and get through the airport is also easily more than an hour. So high-speed rail is looking really good. Given the project is leaning in the might actually happen direction, I think it's also sort of interesting to talk about how that initial phase from Dallas to Houston could be extended to make the network even more useful. The obvious initial extension completes the Texas Triangle, extending the line from south of Dallas to Waco, Austin, and San Antonio, adding another 5 million residents to the catchment area of the system over around 200 miles of track. Now, to be fair, the density of residents on this new leg of the system would only be around half of the initial segment, but hopefully you could get the construction costs down and do more transit-oriented development to drive ridership up. And to be fair, Austin and San Antonio are growing really quickly. And then there are a number of suburban extensions that look really good that would help extend the system to more parts of the cities, reducing the last mile problem and effectively bringing train service to more people. In Houston, a 20 mile extension could add two more stations providing a city center connection and more coverage of the suburbs of the city, providing a southeast, central, and northwest station for Houston. Another option, albeit less nice, would be to do a cheaper extension of the Houston light rail network to the high speed rail station, which would be about seven miles. On the Dallas end of the line, a 20 mile extension could actually get you from central Dallas all the way to DFW Airport, which is a major international airport and actually is soon going to have three rail connections already. The additional high speed connection would be super valuable though, because it would allow people from all over Texas to access the really good roster of international flights from Tokyo to Paris from Dallas Fort Worth. This would create a bit of a Netherlands situation where people from a ton of different cities could be connected to a single giant airport with international air service. Even better, you could then create another spur off of this branch to the airport to connect to central Fort Worth, providing a lot of coverage of the Dallas-Fort Worth area similar to with Houston. The nice thing about building modern elevated high speed or regional rail in the Texan cities, if we're going to be completely honest, is that they actually do have a lot of existing utility, rail, and highway corridors. So it doesn't seem like it would be all that hard to find the land and the space that is mostly free of NIMBYs to build new lines. At the end of the day, all of these extensions would give you a roughly 600 mile, 10 station high speed network that would cover the vast majority of Texas's urban population and provide a really good service. You could even go beyond Texas, although it's less clear if it would pencil out. A line all the way to Chicago would be about a thousand miles from Dallas, or around a five hour trip on an express train, although there would be a mix of service types. Despite this, it would actually still be fairly competitive with air. It's a two and a half hour flight from Dallas to Chicago and the airports are fairly far from the city centers and they're big. So you actually have a competitive shot with high speed rail from Dallas to Chicago. An extension to Chicago would also add 17 million people to the system's catchment via Oklahoma City, St. Louis, Wichita, Kansas City, and Springfield. And that would actually mean you're not even adding that many less riders per mile than the extension to Austin and San Antonio. Plus, with an extension crossing so many state lines, it would be possible to put together a pretty powerful political coalition, as long as someone doesn't try to sabotage it, which has happened before. To be fair, this idea is just wishful thinking. It's not on Alan Levy's really well thought out gravity model based high speed rail map, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Now, the obvious question with all of this is, can it actually happen? And I personally think so. Private businesses should be supportive because of the economic development benefits and better transportation services. The cities of Houston and Dallas are already supportive of the plan, and Texas A&M University would obviously also be wise to support it. I also think you could probably frame it in such a way as to get the average Texan support if you kind of sell the project as getting high-speed rail between the biggest cities before California. Now, to be perfectly clear, this project is not perfect by any means. No project is. The connections to the cities could be a lot better, and it is going to be hard to draw massive amounts of ridership from cities that are so sprawling. So it would also have been good to see more stations on the first phase. But I've long believed that the most important thing for getting more high-speed rail built in America, or any high-speed rail built, depending on how you define high-speed rail, is getting a single world-beating electric high-speed rail line that travels at world-class speeds operating between two major urban areas. And Texas Central does this. 
I just believe the reality is once people can ride the system and see what an economic boost it provides, it will be inevitable that the initial system gets expanded and more systems open up in other states. And the good thing is that the shortcomings with Texas Central can be rectified pretty easily with some extensions later down the road. In a lot of ways, the corridor from Dallas to Houston is the best in the country when you consider the population, existing transit services, and the ease of construction of such a line. Houston and Dallas are both really big and they're surprisingly close together. On an international basis, this would be a high-speed line that would have been built in most countries a long time ago. And the nice thing is that there's a virtuous cycle between the high-speed rail that will be built and the urban transit in these cities. So the urban transit feeds more high-speed rail customers and more high-speed rail customers become transit riders. Probably most importantly though, Texas Central gives the independent system model of high-speed rail a shot in North America. It helps build another big profit center for Amtrak if they end up getting on board, one that isn't in the Northeast or the Midwest, but is in the fast-growing Sunbelt that is quite politically influential in the US. And it also gives all of us a taste of state-of-the-art high-speed rail. Ultimately, I believe the path to perfect high-speed rail in the US is probably via imperfect high-speed rail. Thanks for watching.